Aiden, don't be loud, please. Good evening, Good evening everybody. everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Okay, now we're good. So if that didn't get your attention, <laughs> this will. Okay, I have good news and bad news. Bad news first. I got a call this morning from Bob Rice that his wife has COVID. Yes. So he said, I'm going to stay home and take care of her, but I am willing to send someone else or do this live for you on the screen. So we chose live on the screen because we're counting on Bob Rice. <laughs> his son had it last week and Friday he said, I'm good. I've got no symptoms. I'm coming. <laughs> so we're sad about that, but you will enjoy him on the screen. So I'm going to, and Josh, thanks to Josh, we, we will have him on the screen. But there, if people are going, people may ask you why we're not live streaming and it's because we're Zooming and there's too much that can go wrong between streaming in and streaming out. You know, we're lucky to stream in, right? <laughs> so St. Isadora Seville, pray for us. So Josh got it all ready for us and we are we're so grateful. And uh, Bob is still willing to do it at his end, even though he has um, a sick, some sick family members on his hand. So I am going to introduce Bob. <clears throat> Dr. Bob Rice, uh, father and I have known for mm, probably 15 or 16 years. We've, we met him at Steubenville um, going to different conferences, either for me as a youth minister or we took kids to conferences at, Saint Fran at, at uh, Steubenville, Franciscan University at Steubenville. So he is uh, a professor of catechetics and he directs the MACE program, which is their online master's program. And I just noticed that his PhD is from Liverpool, like in England, right? So uh, he is quite accomplished. He wears a lot of bow ties. He is a musician. He is an author. He is very funny. Can he hear me? Is he like making faces at me like father does all the time? <laughs> he is a, a husband and a father, seven kids, seven, yep, seven kids. Yes. So, uh, yeah, he has kids in college, a couple kids in college, and all the way down, I think, to seven years old. I listened to that podcast, so I stalk you yeah. and Father Dave on the podcast. But So, um, Bob Rice is here on the screen, ready to tell us how to evangelize in a hostile culture. Thanks, Tina. Hey, everybody. Yeah, so I wasn't wrong. I mean, I feel awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, it certainly was a case of my wife not feeling well. So please keep us in your prayers. Uh, thankfully, uh, we're not getting as badly hit as some have with this disease. Uh, just kind of a nasty flu, achiness, feverish kind of thing. But, you know, if you could pray that my wife feels better soon, that the rest of the fam uh, stays healthy, that would be awesome. And I'm so bummed that uh, I'm not able to be with you in person, but I'm really psyched that I still get to talk and share with you who are live in the church, and I know this recording will be available for others. So let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of knowing your Son. Uh, we thank you for the gift of knowing you through your Son. And we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, which you gave us uh, in our baptism to be able to share the good news of your Son and you to all that we meet. Uh, please bless us in this time. Bless the words I say. Bless those who are listening. Uh, that we can really be empowered uh, to know what it is you want us to do uh, to rebuild the church. Uh, through your love. And we ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Tina mentioned one of my many things that I do is I direct, she, she called it the MACE program. MACE actually stands for Master of Arts in Catechetics and Evangelization. And the evangelization part is a lot of what I get to teach at Franciscan University. So when Tina asked if I could give a talk on evangelization in a hostile culture, I'm like, yes, I absolutely love, love talking about this because it's such an essential thing in the life of the church today. I don't have to tell you guys uh, that 
our numbers have been declining fairly steadily and particularly in the last 20 years, really rapidly. And we need to do something about it. And the Lord has given us everything we need, but sometimes we just don't recognize that we already have that toolkit. And so that's part of what I hope I will get you excited about and uh, empowered about, because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for us. When we look at the decline of the numbers in the church, I mean, there's a lot of folks we can blame, right? Let's blame the bishops. Let's blame the catechists. Let's blame the families. Let's blame the Catholic schools. Let's blame the internet. Actually, we, we should blame the internet, okay? <laughs> like that, that really deserves a lot of the problem, right? But the, the real thing we need to do is just take a look at ourselves and ask the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And part of that means we need to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. So some of the numbers, uh, you know, just over the past 20 years, 20 years ago, this was the year 2000, uh, one out of four Americans were Catholics. And today it's one out of five. So we've dropped a huge number of percentages. And the numbers, sadly, they just keep going down and down. Now, all Christianity has been taking a hit lately. You've probably heard that phrase, the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, those that say they don't belong to any religious group at all. That's becoming one of the largest religious groups in the United States, ironically. Well, Catholicism has actually been hit harder than any other, uh, any other Christianity, any other group of Christians. In fact, right now in the United States, 13% of Americans are former Catholics. That's, that's over one out of 10. And that means that for every new person we bring into the church during RCIA, there's about six or seven who have left. You know, we're not balancing out numbers. Now, I would say that sometimes, sadly, the church has had an attitude, particularly for those numbers or young people, they say things like, well, they'll come back, you know, to get married or for baptisms and stuff. And really, we, they're, they're not coming back. Um, in 1980, there were 351,000 Catholic marriages in the United States. In the year 2000, there were 261,000. And in uh, 2018, so just a little bit before the craziness of the pandemic, uh, we were down to 131,000. And, and meanwhile, the, the overall American population is increasing, and we're not even keeping steady to population. We are severely, severely decreasing in our numbers. Why is that happening? There's a lot of reasons for it, but I, I come back to this idea of evangelization, uh, something that we're not really good at in the United States. Um, it's something that we're not really used to. I, I don't want to make it you know, sound like, oh, we stink at evangelization. A lot of times I would just say the church hasn't experienced evangelization. That's different from our Protestant brothers and sisters. If you ever look at a history of, of Christianity in the United States, uh, our Protestant brothers and sisters had a number of moments which they called the Great Awakenings. These would be tent revival movements. A lot of them happened in the beginning, you know, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And it even carried on into the 50s and 60s with televangelism, you know, uh, the Billy Graham crusade or other things, you know, like that. The Catholics never really had something like that. I mean, we certainly had Bishop, you know, Fulton Sheen on TV, which was cool. And, and we have some great examples of evangelization, but nothing like a nationwide movement that has really, you know, rocked the country and brought about a lot of beautiful, you know, conversions and transformations and changes of hearts. I mean, we can all point to and know of you know, really cool converts to Catholicism. I mean, I work with many of them at Franciscan University, but again, for every convert we get, we seem to be losing six or seven somewhere else. And I would say that part of the issue is that uh, the, the Catholic Church in the United States came about more through immigration than evangelization. Even to this day, the reason our numbers are as good as they are, and they're not very good, is because of an influx of immigration. I think about a third of the church today is foreign born. So that's, that's still representing a huge number, which means like, where did the people go that weren't foreign born in, in the previous numbers, right? And it, I would say often it's just not a part of our, our Catholic imagination because many of us didn't experience being evangelized. 
you know, we were raised in Catholic homes. Now, this is the majority of us. There's going to be some of you there that had a, that beautiful experience. But many of us were just raised in Catholic homes. Uh, our, our parents, you know, loved the church, loved the Lord, brought us up in that. It became part of our identity. It became part of who we are. And we just continued to live that out. But even the idea that we're supposed to share the faith with others, I, sometimes I, I talk to Catholics and they go, no, no that's, that's, that's what Protestants do. Well, that's, that attitude is part of why the church is diminishing. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And, and what does it mean, uh, what's the difference between a disciple of Jesus Christ or a fan of Jesus Christ? Tina mentioned she listened to my podcast. I hope you check it out. It's, it's really fun. I do it with a good friend of mine, Father Dave Pavanka. He's the president of Franciscan University. If you're into podcasts, you might not be, and that's totally fine. But um, one thing I continually bring up on that podcast is how much of a fan I am of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let me pause as you all boo. And we're back. So um, I've been, a, I'm not a bandwagoner. I was a fan since I was a teenager. Actually, when I was a teenager, uh, my family moved to Tampa. And that was when they were in the creamsicle outfits and they were just like the worst team in the NFL. But my dad got season tickets and I started to go with my dad and just really great memories of me and my dad connecting, having great conversations. I mean, that's some of the fun thing about sports, right? You know, we can all get together and have a great time with that. Um, and if you visited my house here in Steubenville, I actually have a whole, it's really, it's pathetic. I have a whole room. Uh, it's like a sunroom and we call it the bay. <laughs> and there's like, like the floor of it is like, uh, it looks like the, the field at, at Raymond James Stadium and there's pictures everywhere and I've got like a Tampa Bay lamp and um, it, it's really, really obnoxious. Um, and I'm a huge fan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and, and I enjoy the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I love watching the games. I love wearing the jerseys. I have a group of friends who are all, you know, from Tampa, from Florida, and we all text each other and we get really excited about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I am a fan. Um, I would never try to convert you to Buccaneerism, um, you know, though I could, I could at least right now mention many good reasons why you should. Uh, historically, no, it's just, a, it's just really a bad idea. And let's face it, this is just going to last for like a year or so, and then we're going to go right back down to the bottom. But I like talking about it with my friends. I like talking about it with the group of people that I might watch a game with. Well, I would compare that to maybe sometimes our attitude with Catholicism. I think many of us are Catholic fans. Uh, we, we love going to church. Uh, we love listening to Christian music or Catholic music, Catholic podcasts. Um, you know, we like being a part of the community. And when we're with others in the community, we're really happy to talk about things in the faith and have those conversations. But it's that next step that becomes the challenge for us. And I would say particularly in the United States, which is a culture that is hostile, not, not just to Catholicism, but to religion in general. But I would say Catholicism is like the poster child of religion in general. I mean, people think religion and they often think Catholicism, you know, the big churches and the incense and the Latin and, and all of those, you know, stereotypes that, that go along with it. And so what the Lord wants us to do is he wants us to be more than just somebody that likes being Catholic and feels blessed by being Catholic. Those aren't bad things. That's actually where you start. Okay. We, we start off as fans. What's crazy is that the Lord is inviting us onto the field. The Lord is inviting us to be a part of the team. He didn't make this so that we would sit, you know, on a chair somewhere and kind of root for Catholicism and hope somebody else does a really good job of, you know, being Catholic. The invitation for all of us, for, for you and for me, is that we would be on the field, that we would be people participating in the mission of Jesus Christ. Okay, we have a really good quarterback, even better than Tom Brady. Uh, we have Jesus Christ as our quarterback. And he's, he's going to put the ball in our hands, right? And he's calling the plays. And we can, we can trust in him. But we've got to be able to go out and do it, you know, to put on the jersey and, and to do that. Now, that might be an intimidating, uh, that might be intimidating for you to hear. It's, it's actually intimidating for me to say, and I'm not a big fan of athletic analogies. This might surprise you. I'm not a very athletic person. I know. Go figure, right? 
Um, some people, the, the first question they ask me other than, other than is that your natural tan is, is where do you work out? I, I don't, you know, it's just, it's just kind of a thing. I hope you're laughing. Boy, I hate Zoom talks. Anyway, maybe if you guys could like laugh like this or something like that, then I, cause I can see, uh, oh, you guys are so sweet. Back at you, back at you peeps. Um, but like the idea of like being on a team, like kind of scares the crud out of me. I'm like, I am not worthy to be on a team. I'm sure there are better people. Uh, I'm sure there are, you know, you know, more talented people that could go out and, and do that. And I think that's some of the fears that we need to address before I even talk about how to evangelize. I, I want to start addressing some of those concerns of, I don't think I, I should evangelize. And one of the big concerns is I'm not, uh, either I'm not holy enough or I'm not intelligent enough. Let's start with the holy enough. We all feel like somebody, you know, a saint can evangelize, but I probably shouldn't. Here's the beautiful thing. When I share the faith with somebody, I'm actually sharing about how God took someone like me, a sinner, you know, uh, someone who's often unfaithful, uh, who's often selfish, and in his incredible love has invited me into a relationship with him, even, even in spite of myself. It's a faith for sinners that's so important to remember. I love the quote of Pope Francis. He talked about how the church isn't a museum of saints, but it's a field hospital for sinners. And we have to begin with that humility because, you know, I remember there was one saint that said evangelization is essentially one beggar telling another where to find the food. We're not coming at it from a triumphal attitude of, oh, I'm so great and I'm so smart. You know, you should join, you know, my faith. We're coming at it with a humility of, yeah, I'm at, actually, I'm not perfect. And being not perfect makes you a better evangelist than somebody who seems to have all their crap together. Jesus said that I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So if you feel like you're a sinner, you're sitting in the right place. Uh, you're sitting in the Catholic Church. And that's who Jesus is calling. One of my favorite quotes in scripture, it's kind of an odd one. But it was a critique that the Pharisees had about Jesus. He said, this man um, sits down with sinners and eats with them. Because in that time in the culture, you would only sit down and eat with like close family members. And you would never, you know, break bread with somebody who had any type of sin or uncleanness or scandal. And he, Jesus did that all the time. This man sits down with sinners and eats with them. I wish that on the door of every Catholic church that was engraved in the stone around it, this man sits down with sinners and eats with them because that's what the liturgy is about. That is the invitation that Jesus has for all of us. So if you feel like you're not holy enough to share the faith with somebody else, actually that means you're ready for it because we want to share honestly that, yeah, I actually don't, I don't live up to everything that the church teaches. I, I don't. And, and if people are in my family or in my workplace, they see me not doing that on a regular basis, right? And Jesus is still inviting me and I want to be better and the Holy Spirit is changing me. So that's the, that's the language that we want to use. So don't worry about if you're not holy enough. You are because Jesus is working in you. And it's through our weakness that Christ can shine. That's what St. Paul said. And he was one of the greatest evangelists of all, and maybe one of the greatest sinners, because before he was converted, he was out there killing Christians. Like, that's really bad. Like, that's really, really bad. And see what the Lord did with him and what the Lord can do with us. Fear number two, I'm not smart enough. Well, I would have you think differently of how we might share the faith with others. There is a whole world of uh, Christian apologetics, and it's, it's actually kind of cool. Uh, there's lots of fun arguments out there and ways to answer the arguments. And if they say this, you say this. And if they say this, you say this, right? Right. And there are people that are talented and gifted apologists. Evangelization is not just apologetics. There might be a moment for that. Maybe there's a moment that somebody needs that. That's when I tell them to go read a book. But what evangelization really is about, it's about the witness of a life that has been transformed by Jesus Christ. And the wonderful thing about a witness is that nobody can argue against a witness. 
It's a witness. So when I share with somebody what the Lord has done in my life, they can't say, no, he didn't, right? <laughs> he did. And, and I know he did. And I, and I know that I know that he did. I, I have certainty about how different my life is because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it's the most exciting, wonderful, crazy adventure I can be on. And evangelization, the church says over and over again, always begins with a witness of faith. It always begins that they need to see something in us that's different than what the world has to offer. And in fact, we want to be living the faith in such a joyful and loving way that eventually people start asking us about what we believe. How do you have such joy in the midst of difficulty? How do you have such peace in the time of anxiety? And the answer is, well, let me tell you about somebody, <laughs> somebody who's important to my life, Jesus Christ. Now, I've mentioned the name of Jesus a lot so far. I'll probably keep mentioning his name, but I want to highlight that one really important element of evangelization is that we use the name of Jesus. Because I think it's hard to evangelize somebody into Catholicism, right? Because Catholicism is like an institution and it's a building and it's a thing, right? But Jesus is a person, a person who loves us. And the Catholic Church is the body of Christ, but you get to know the head first, and then you, you actually encounter the head through the body. And this is something I think our Protestant brothers and sisters do a better job with than we do. Um, you know, even though the church over and over uses this word, we need to be Christocentric, you know, which is centered on, uh, on Christ. Uh, with my students, I actually use the word, I'm, I'm going to change that word, I'm going to say Jesus-centric. <laughs> which is we just need to specifically use the personal name of Jesus Christ, because that's the name above all other names. Christ is a title. Jesus is a person. And what we want to do is we want to introduce other people into our love for Jesus. The church is the bride of Christ, right? That's who we are. But you're only a bride if you love the groom. So what we want to do as people that are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is we want them to know the groom so that when they get to the point of how can I best love the groom, the answer is be in his bride, which is the Catholic Church, you know, the fullness of the faith. But it just, it starts with Jesus and, and it continues with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. It's, it really is, it really is all about Jesus. For those of you that are saying, now, wait a second, what about the Father and the Spirit? Well, Jesus reveals to us the Father and the Spirit. Remember, uh, you know, when we talk about the Father uh, in the Last Supper in John's Gospel, uh, it was Philip who said, Jesus, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, have you been with me all this time and you still do not know me? And Philip's like, oh, like, you know, Jesus, like I am the Father, right? Uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the Spirit. He reflects the Spirit. What we know about the Spirit comes from Jesus. What we know about the Father comes from Jesus. Jesus is the Word made flesh, the incarnate God, fully God, fully man like us in all things but sin. And since that's how the Trinity was revealed to us, Jesus came in the flesh and then revealed the Father and the Spirit. In a similar way, we want to model that when we're sharing the faith with others. We just want to, we want to, talk, about, we want to talk about Jesus. And again, what has Jesus done in our life? How is knowing Jesus in my life made a difference. And I know Jesus not in the way that somebody might know a great philosopher, you know, or a great poet, or, you know, whatever it is. You know, it's more than Jesus as a really good teacher that gives me some good advice. But Jesus is somebody who actually dwells in my life and dwells in my heart. Jesus is somebody I receive, physically receive when I go to Mass, that I, I physically hear when I go to reconciliation, you know. Um, and, and we start being able to share the good news of Jesus in that way. That's, I find for many Catholics, that's a little weird. Maybe you're a little bit weirded out, you know, by that language, but I think it's just an important thing that we start thinking about and, and reflecting on. And so before we even start sharing the gospel with somebody, sometimes it's just good to ask ourselves, if somebody asked me about my faith, what would I say? What, what would I talk about? 
And I wonder if you might not naturally talk about Jesus. And maybe that's something you should, you should think about. You know, I've found a lot of times people talk about Catholicism without mentioning Jesus at all. You know, they talk about uh, the, the surety of the doctrine and, and the, the beauty of tradition and, you know, the glory of the liturgy and, and how wonderful the history and the example of the saints. And all of these things are, are great but all of them actually at, at their heart are about Jesus. And so are we at our heart about Jesus? Because I can tell you this, it's kind of easy to share Jesus. It's hard to share the church, you know, but it's a lot easier to share Jesus because we're just trying to introduce somebody to a person, uh, a person who's amazing, a person who's incredible. Jesus Christ is the most exciting, dynamic, amazing, wonderful person who ever walked the face of the earth ever, right? No human being has had an impact on human history like Jesus has. You know, I mean, more, more buildings have been uh, named after Jesus or his followers than anyone in human history. More books have been written than, about Jesus than anyone in human history. The Bible, you know, the, the book about him, a number one bestseller with zeros. They, they created the printing press for the very reason so people could know about Jesus. More countries, more cities named after Jesus or his followers than anybody in human history. I mean, even, you know, it's 2021 20, AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. They, they decided to rename time after Jesus. You know, you've, you know your big deal when they've renamed time after you, right? And so there's a beauty about who Jesus is. And I would encourage all of you, if you don't do this already, read the Gospels, okay? Um, the Gospels are the principal source of the life and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's no other source, actually. And anything that we know about Jesus corresponds to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're familiar with the Gospels as regular churchgoers. You hear a little bit every Sunday or every day if you go to Mass. We, we don't have a liturgy without a gospel, right? That shows how important the gospels are. You have to hear the word before you can experience the word in the flesh. And yet I find it's not uncommon among many Catholics that they've actually never read the gospels themselves. You've never sat down and read the gospels like you might read a book, you know, you wouldn't buy a book and open the book up in the middle and then try to read like a couple paragraphs and go, oh, well, that was kind of interesting, and then close the book, and then later like open it up for another few paragraphs and go, oh, well, that's kind of interesting, right? You'd read it from beginning to end. I'd encourage you, if you haven't done this, maybe this can be something in, in your own life that will, I know it will bless you. Start reading a gospel from beginning to end. You're going to be shocked at a few things. First of all, you're going to read things that you never heard about. I mean, you're going to be like, what? I've been Catholic all my life and I've never read the story before. You might have heard it at a mass, but maybe some of you daydream at mass. I don't want to be judgmental. I know I daydream at mass all the time. Um, you know, maybe it's kind of vague, but like you're going to get to some stories and you're going to go, wait, what? Like, what? What is that about? Okay. And that's beautiful. Like there's things about Jesus that you don't know. And when you read the gospels beginning to end, you, you get it. The other thing you'll get really surprised about is you'll start seeing how one story connects to another. You know, like you kind of get it when you hear it on Sundays, but not, not totally, you know, like sometimes we don't get that the reason Jesus went out to a faraway place with his apostles and the crowds followed him and you had that thing of the 5,000. Why, why, why was he trying to go off to a quiet place? He just heard that his cousin John had died. And so we wanted some quiet moments, and, but people wouldn't leave him alone, right? And that's why after he did that, then he still left and he, he had to walk on water to get out of there. Like those connections of the narrative are, are really amazing. And they just, even the stories you know, you go, oh, that makes so much more sense now because you can see how one thing flows into another. The principal source of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ are in four fairly short books. I mean, lengthwise, they're about the length of, um, you know, probably like a couple chapters in a, in a modern novel. And, and, and if I haven't sold you on reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, here's the real kicker. Um, I'm sure everybody here wants to go to heaven, right? Amen? Amen. Yay. Amen. Good. So when you go to heaven, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be lots of bacon. That's my own personal theology, but we'll just move on from that. 
um, you're going to meet Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when they say, how do you like my book? It's just going to be really awkward. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to spare you eternal awkwardness. Or you keep trying to, like, avoid them, you know, at the coffee shop and stuff. Um, and especially if you've read, like, all the Harry Potter books, I mean, you have no excuse at that point, right? If you're, if you're that invested in something else, like, you just got to read the Gospels, all right? So read the Gospels. By the way, that's also a good reason to read the rest of the Bible, but that's, that's another story. Uh, the Gospels, the Gospels, the Gospels. There's a reason why we stand. Uh, Gospels are preeminent in Scripture. And what I want you to do is I want you to just get to know Jesus more as a person. See, this is the other beautiful thing about the Gospels. Sometimes when we hear the Gospels read at the liturgy, um, we, we get a bit selfish with it, and we think, what does this gospel have to do with me? Which makes sense, because oftentimes the homily is trying to be geared that way, too. It, it's, it's trying to kind of wake you up and connect you with things. And so we kind of get used to, well, what do the gospels have to do with me? What's beautiful when you read the gospels from the beginning to the end is actually, what do the gospels have to do with God? Jesus is the mediator and sum total of all revelation. He's God in the flesh. The best way I can learn about who God is, is reading the Gospels. There's, there's not a better way of learning about who God is. It's in the Gospels. Even the letters, which are another beautiful way, are just unpacking what we hear in those Gospels. And so we start to encounter Jesus not as a way of how can he help me or what does he want me to do, what does he want from me, right? But more like what he wants for me, um, how he conveys his love, his mercy. He wants us to know who he is. Because when we know more of who he is, we fall in love. If it's just what he wants of us, I mean, that's like a, that's like a boss, right? Not like a good boss, like you're, you know, but like an like a employee boss. Um, and sadly, I would say sometimes, and I fall into this trap myself, sometimes I can get into that relationship with God. I, I think of God as kind of my boss and I'm his, you know, employee of the month. At least that's what I'm trying to do, right? And what Jesus reveals actually is that God is our father and he wants us to be his sons and daughters. And he wants a, a different type of relationship with us than maybe the kind of relationship we would assume that he would want us to have. And so reading the gospels, being saturated in the gospels, um, help us to just get to know him. And, and I think that's such an important element in our faith. And I would say sometimes a missing element. So I mentioned I was the director of the Master of Arts in Catechetics and Evangelization. Um, so I do a lot about catechesis as well. And I'm convinced that one of the biggest errors that we've suffered in the church in the last few decades in catechesis is that we've spent more time talking about what God wants of us than who God is. And by doing that, Catholicism seems like this overbearing, lots of rules, you know, lots of issues, you know, as opposed to a, a love relationship. Because when it's a love relationship, then the rules actually just kind of make sense. I could talk about my marriage in terms of rules and it would sound horrible. You know, oh man, I work all day, but she takes my money and I have to take out the garbage, you know, and blah, 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 right? I don't mind doing that stuff because I love her, you know, and, and love makes that stuff not as burdensome. At, at least when I'm in a loving mode, I get selfish and I complain at times. And then I'm just reminded of how much she does for me, right? But that's the idea that we would be men and women in love with Jesus. That's what a bride should be. That's what Catholics should be as the bride. We love the head. We love the groom. And we are able to talk about that and share that with others from our own, from our own witness, from our own life. So it's not that, you know, you're not holy enough. You are. Actually, it's through your weakness that Christ is strong. It's not that you're not smart enough. You don't need a degree in theology because you are sharing, uh, you're specifically sharing about your relationship with Jesus, how you experience Christ in the Catholic Church, how that's changed your life. And, and that's the witness of faith. It's good to know a few other books that are out there because sometimes they might have questions that you don't know the answer to. That's, that's totally fine. 
though I find it's actually more a matter of the heart. I've spent uh, a good few decades, particularly with youth and young adults, you know, sharing the faith with others. And there are some questions that people have, but more often than not, when people kind of have a long list of questions as to why they're not Catholic or why they left the church, it usually comes down to the fact that they didn't feel loved there, you know, that they didn't experience the, the gospel there. I, I'm always heartbroken when I meet a Protestant who is an ex-Catholic, and I just feel sad that they didn't hear that message uh, in the Catholic Church, you know, and they have a right to be kind of angry about it. You know, I, I went to Catholic Church all my life and Catholic school and da da da, and I didn't hear about Jesus till I walked into a Protestant church. And yeah, that's heartbreaking. You know, that that that's heartbreaking. And I pray that we as a church would just be better at proclaiming the good news, at talking about Jesus, at, at sharing Jesus. So don't worry about being not holy enough. Don't worry about being not smart enough. Read the Gospels. Uh, be an expert on the Gospels. You can. They're very short. And particularly be an expert about how Jesus has impacted and changed your life. But the last thing I want to focus on in, in my talk with you today is that I want you and all of us to be more intentional about opportunities to share Jesus with others. There's a quote that's attributed to St. Francis, which I really like and I really hate. And it goes something like this. You know, St. Francis says, preach the gospel to all nations and when necessary, use words. Now, what I like about that quote is the emphasis that it is actually the witness of our lives that brings about the opportunity to share the gospel. And, and that is a very, very true statement. It is the witness of our life. Uh, people, you know, want to know why we're different. That means we have to be seeming like we're a little bit different. If we just seem like everybody else, that's just not very interesting at all. But the implication like, but, and when necessary, use words is it makes it sound like, well, sometimes it might not be necessary. Okay. It's always necessary. It is always necessary. Uh, and the, the scriptures couldn't be clearer about that. In fact, one of the famous lines of St. Paul is he's like, how can somebody believe if they haven't heard? How can somebody hear if somebody hasn't been spoken? And how can somebody speak if they haven't been sent to speak and to preach? And that's the idea. Like, you don't believe in Jesus by osmosis. You know, you don't just kind of like you're near Catholics and that makes you Catholic, right? Like, that's, that's just not how it works. I could sit in my garage all day. It does not make me my car. You know, just because I'm in the same place as other things doesn't make me those other things. We need to be able to actually then explain, and this is what St. Peter says, always be ready to give reason for the hope that you have in your heart. You know, that means we're like looking for opportunities to be ready to talk about Jesus. We're finding little reasons, little ways to let people know that we believe in Jesus and we are happy to share that if they, are, if they are so inclined. So it begins by wanting it, okay? It begins by actually praying every day, Lord, give me an opportunity to share your gospel today. It's a scary prayer, but it's an important one to pray. Because here's the thing, like sharing the gospel is, is awesome. It is, it's a privilege, it's a gift. And the Lord wants to give this gift to you right now, wants to give this gift to you in its fullness. But he's not gonna force a gift into your hands. So we actually have to ask for the gift. Lord, give me the honor of in some small or big way, sharing your gospel today. Back in the days before uh, COVID, I flew a lot. Um, you know, and I was on the plane a lot. And I noticed there was a difference when I would pray, Lord, as I'm on the plane, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. I would have great conversations. And when I was kind of tired and, uh, and I didn't say that prayer, I, I didn't. Because it's an honor to share the gospel, right? And I needed to be like, whoa, Lord, I need to be attuned to the fact that this is a gift that you're, you know, it's not like, oh, God really needs me. And okay, fine, God, I'll do it for you. You know, it's like, whoa, I get to do this. And so even just starting in your life, Lord, just give me an opportunity somewhere, somehow to be a positive witness of a follower of Jesus, to be a positive witness of someone who's Catholic. 
the Lord will start giving you those opportunities. He, he wants you to have those opportunities. He's not going to force them on you, though. I mean, God is so gentle. He's going to do it if you ask. So ask, 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 please ask. Because I find nothing more exciting than sharing the gospel and being a conduit of, of God's grace. Okay, so we begin by asking for this. And sometimes as we ask for it, the Lord puts on our heart certain people in our life that we just start, we just start praying for. But evangelization is a movement of the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I love what St. Paul VI says about it. All, you know, techniques of evangelization are good, but nothing can replace the gentle action of the Holy Spirit. We need to follow the Holy Spirit. There's people in our lives, probably our families, right, that we really, really want to share the gospel with. And we have to be docile to the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, there's folks in my lives that I have not followed the lead on the Holy Spirit with in sharing the gospel. It has never gone well. It has never gone well, right? It becomes an argument. It becomes something that's just ugh, not, not good. But there's people in your family, people at your work, maybe even a stranger, that if we're, again, Holy Spirit, give me the opportunity. And we're looking for that opportunity to do an act of charity, to do an act of love, uh, to in encourage people. Something I really like doing is I like offering prayer for people. Um, when I was in college, I went to, I didn't go to uh, Franciscan University as an undergrad. I went to a, another college which didn't have any kind of Christian affiliation. And so most of my time was I, I spent with, with non, not only non-Catholics, non-Christians. And I made a decision that I was always going to pray before every meal, even when I'm with other people. And um, I didn't do like the bless us, O Lord, and these like gifts, you know, because I thought that'd be a little bit weird. But I'd always say, hey, is it cool if I say a prayer thanking God for this food? Generally, people were like, oh, okay. And I would say, God, thank you so much for this food and this time together. Please bless those that don't have any. Amen. Just boom. That's that simple. I tried to do a lot of other things at the college I was at. I tried to do like a Bible study. I tried, you know, and everything fell flat on its face. And actually, by the time I got to the end of that college, I thought, Lord, I didn't really make any difference in people's lives. But when I graduated, you know, we had yearbooks and everybody signed the yearbooks. So many people said, I was so amazed at your faith. Or they'd even say, that was the first time I ever prayed in my life. And they were talking about like when I just ate food with them. It's actually the little things that can be really, really powerful. When we know somebody is uh, down or struggling, just to say, can I pray for you? You know, I've done that at restaurants. You know, when I see the waitress frazzled or other stuff like that, I just say, is there anything I can pray for you for? It takes a lot of courage to be sure. But like, I've never had anybody be like, how dare you, sir? You know, how dare you pray for me? Like everybody actually kind of likes that. Even like atheists. I've met people who are like atheists and they're like, well, I don't believe in God, but that's really cool that you offered. So thanks. Okay. And that's the end of it, but that's okay. Because we're just making opportunities. You know, I would say four times out of five, when I offer to pray for somebody, they're like, mm, maybe not, or yeah, maybe pray for my mom. But there's that fifth time that's like, yeah. And, and they share something like, really profound. And, you know, I even try to take out my phone and write down details. You know, I'm like, I, and I will definitely be praying for you, you know, and it's just those things that that's what as disciples we should be doing. We should be living a little differently. We should be living a little louder than other people. Do, do folks that you work with, those of you that, you know, work at a job, do they know that you're Catholic? Um, and I don't want them to know because you're like obnoxious, you know, about it. Um, I want them to know because you're loving. Um, maybe you have a picture in your office of Jesus or Mary. Uh, maybe you're offering to pray for people. I don't, I don't know. I think there's a lot of ways to do it right, but we just got to, we just got to do it. You know, we have to do it in small and simple ways. We have to do it in big ways, but it begins with that come Holy Spirit, because at the end of the day, you know, I've done, you know, evangelistic ministry for over 25 years. And I can say with great confidence that I have never changed the heart of anybody because conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not me. I'm offering myself as a witness. I'm offering myself as a conduit. I'm offering myself as just one of many ways the Lord is reaching his children. And people have responded to that. Um, people have been really blessed by that. And, and praise God. I mean, there's nothing for me more exciting than sharing 
what Jesus did for me. You know, I, I love sharing about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because it's exciting and it's fun, but I'd much rather share about Jesus because it's life-changing and I've seen people's lives be changed. If only we could have the same enthusiasm about our faith than we have about our sports teams or the movies we like or the hobbies that we're into. Uh, if we had that, those numbers would not be decreasing. Uh, they would be increasing. Uh, the world would know uh, the beauty of Jesus Christ and the beauty of loving him as the bride, as the bride of the church, uh, which is what we all get to be a part of in this wonderful work of evangelization. So I'll just close with you know, the words of Jesus, uh, often quoted by uh, St. John Paul II, he, be not afraid. You know, be not afraid actually appears in the scriptures 365 times. And I don't think that's a coincidence. That's one for every day of the year, except leap year. Be afraid on leap year. But other than that, um, we are called to go forth in courage and to go forth and share the gospel of the Lord. In fact, if that sounds a little familiar, that's what you hear at the end of every mass. Mass, the word mass comes from the Latin of the dismissal. In Latin, the, it was ite misa est, uh, which got translated at one point as the mass has ended, go in peace. Uh, and then with the newer English translation, it tried to capture a little bit more of, it's not like a, hey, show's over, go home. The idea of the mass, the misa, ties into the mission. We're supposed to go to the liturgy, get charged up and transformed and burst out the door as living tabernacles, sharing Jesus to the world. That command of go is the same one that Jesus gave his apostles, go and make disciples of all nations. And it's at the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it's one of the most exciting and amazing things to do. So let me close in prayer. Almighty God and heavenly father, I thank you for this opportunity to share with my brothers and sisters, the joy of sharing the gospel. Help us to be not afraid. Uh, remove any fear that we have, Lord God, any excuses, any obstacles that are in the way. Lord, we ask for the honor and the privilege of sharing your gospel. Put people in our lives and give us opportunity to share your love, your transforming, powerful love. Not that we're trying to win an argument or even you know, convert a heart. Lord, that's your job. But that we would be a part of your effort of evangelization in the lives of those that we get to know, whether they be our family, our friends, or those at work. And we trust all of this into your sacred heart. And Blessed Mother Mary, uh, you who are the first evangelist as you gave Jesus to the world, we ask for your intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, I'm really happy uh, to take questions with the, the time we have left. That's certainly what I would do if I was standing there. So uh, I'm standing here in Studentville, Ohio. Hello, Tina. Hmm? Oh, there it is. So, Bob, did you just say you would answer questions? Yep. Yeah, I would, I'd love to. <laughs> I'm going to go get the microphone, unless you all want to stand up here and ask your questions. No, microphone. Okay. <laughs> so, funny story. When Bob told me that his son last week had COVID, I was in the car, and I responded to him via voice text, and I said, come Holy Spirit, please don't, please make sure Bob doesn't get COVID. <laughs> so he doesn't have it. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is alive and well. Doing, I, you may still get it, but I'm glad that you were able to take care of Jenny. <laughs> so I'm going to go get the microphone. Thank you for your question.
I have a question. Okay. <laughs> I, ha I have a question, Bob. Yes. Um, we had a big article in the dispatch today, and I don't know if any of you saw it, but it's always very disheartening when we see an old um, scandal brought up. Hmm. Um, and then it's, of course, relived in, in the media. And we know that the numbers are low for priests. One is too many. Uh, we know that we don't want anyone hurt by this. But when it keeps, it just, it's just like so hard to evangelize through that. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I would say that that is a, um, that's a real common issue out there in the media. In fact, sadly, when people think Catholics, uh, particularly non-Catholics, um, or even fallen away Catholics, that's a reason why many of them say they've, they've fallen away. I would say, first and foremost, just share your own witness of how scandalized and horrified that you are about it. I mean, we all are, you know, it, 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 it kind of the thing, sometimes people feel like, oh, we need to, we need to come to the defense or just try to put it in context. Or other, not, no, it's just horrible. Like, it's just gut-wrenching and it's horrible. And the reason why it's horrible, even the, the reason why the media has an attention of it, and I think in some ways, this, in a kind of a twisted way, it's good that the media gives it so much attention because it means that we expect better of our priests. And that's, that's a good thing. You know, sadly, if there's some school teacher or somebody that, you know, does something like that, it makes the news a little bit and then it drops. But like there is actually a cultural attitude, which is like priests are supposed to be holier than that. Right. And so it's kind of a twisted good thing that they're so shocked about it. And we can be shocked about it as well. In fact, I think we need to be because when people have brought that up to me, I've just joined in on how tragic and how sad it is that this occurred. And they're usually surprised that I'm tragic and sad about it. And they say, so then why are you still Catholic? Ah, you fell into my trap. <laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus, right? Because for me, being Catholic uh, is, is not about that. And in fact, the reason I'm scandalized is because that's clearly people falling short of the gospel. Now, by the way, I fall short of the gospel as well. I pray never that heinously, right? But um, and it just gives me a chance to be honest and vulnerable to say, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad and it's horrible. But uh, let me tell you why I'm still Catholic, why I didn't leave the church. It's because Jesus is present in the church. It's because the gospel is still true. Um, it's because the actions of some people um, are not who the church is. The church is the bride of Christ. Even, even frustration at the way bishops handled it in the current or the past. Um, the Catholic Church is more than that. You know, it, it's the people of God. It's the bride of Christ. Um, you know, it's, it's all of those things. And so it is an opportunity to actually say in the midst of this, why would anybody be Catholic? Um, and again, just, just an opportunity for witness. But I, I would say like practically speaking, um, just kind of own it you know, in the sense of, yeah, it's horrible. Like, don't try to defend it, you know, not that anybody naturally would, but sometimes we feel like our, our faith is being attacked and we try to be like, well, you know, and it's bad. It, it's horrible. And, you know, God have mercy on uh, anybody who was abused. God have mercy on those who abused. God have mercy on those who tried to cover it up. And thank you, Jesus, that as a church, we're trying our best to, to move out of the shadows and into the light. And uh, Jesus is still Jesus. He is still Lord. He is still the salvation. The church uh, is both, um, what, is the, what does the church actually say about herself, is perfect and in need of perfection. Uh, she's still the bride, even if the bride has, the dress isn't so good and doesn't look as well. Um, she's still our bride and I'd still die for her, even with all the scandals. And I, I think that's the kind of message that might surprise somebody, you know, but be a positive message in the midst of a lot of negativity.
I can't hear anything, by the way, if that makes a difference. It, it seemed like Father Dave was saying something profound, so I just stopped talking, but. I still can't hear anything, but I'm, I'm glad you didn't leave the church. I saw the camera angle and I saw a bunch of people getting up and walking out and I thought, oh, well, that's the end of this talk. So I'm not getting any sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, heard, I heard that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Often it seems the hardest people to evangelize are those in their own families. Do you have any advice for us in that regard? Um, my advice would be, I mean, first of all, it, 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 it. all right, check. All right. Um, thank you for asking that question. And uh, I have that experience in my own family. Uh, there's particularly somebody uh, who is away from the faith. And um, it is heartbreaking, right? You know, uh, you know, whether it's in our own family, um, you know, whether it's our kids. So first of all, our attitude should be that of prayer. And um, I would add prayer and fasting because uh, that's, a, that's a powerful way of of prayer is that we would take time prayer and fasting. And we would ask the Lord, A, please give me an opportunity to share the gospel with this person. But I'll tell you from experience, um, oftentimes they're kind of inoculized to us and anything we have to say, you know, there might just be too much history there. And so um, I would love it, for example, if I had an opportunity to, to say something profound that would change the heart of one of my family members but I'm praying that somebody else does, you know, um, as I'm, as I'm evangelizing somebody else, that's somebody else's sister or brother that I pray I'm the answered prayer for, <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, I'm saying things to this person that somebody else in their family wishes they could say to them, but they can't. And that's how we work together as a community with everybody we share the faith with. They're related to somebody, probably somebody who's been praying that they would hear the very things that we have to say. And so in a sense, I actually try to share the gospel with other people like I wish I could with some people in my family. And the reality, sadly, is that um, many times I might not be that person that shares that good news with the family member. But here's the really cool uh, part of it. As much as I love that family member, and I do, I totally do, Jesus loves that person even more. And so I can have great confidence that Jesus is actually more concerned about this than I might be. And what he's asking for is he's asking for my prayers and my openness. And, uh, you know, that, that ties in earlier to what I was saying about a docility of the Holy Spirit. I've actually done some damage in my family by trying to move ahead and making more of an argument about Catholicism than a sharing of Jesus working in my life and not following the Spirit enough. Uh, in, in those moments. God is good. He fixes things. You know, none of us are perfect. We don't say anything perfectly. Uh, and we can't blame ourselves for that. But I would say, um, you know, a lot of it would be prayer. I would throw fasting in on that and uh, evangelize to others like you hope somebody would evangelize that person because it might not be through you, um, but God can certainly use somebody else there. That was a great question. Thank you for asking that.
What you've noticed I've avoided uh, the entire night is any kind of formula. Uh, I haven't said if you do A, B, and C, it will equal this. And that goes back to um, what I was trying to say earlier, that beautiful quote from St. Paul VI. Techniques of evangelization are good. Uh, you should check them out. There's some great books on there. But nothing replaces the gentle action of the Holy Spirit. Is that somebody else that wants to ask a question? Hello. Yeah, so this is just, I think, an extension of that question, Bob. How do you get them to go to church? All right, I'm waiting for the feedback to stop. Oh, there we go. Great. Um, well, you know, that's a funny question. Um, I would say that going to church actually might not be the first starting place. Um, I think sometimes as Catholics, we think like the whole goal is to go to church. There's a lot of people in the church, sadly, that might not know the love of Jesus. And uh, it might just be a ritual. It might just be a cultural thing. And that eventually kind of dies away. It's, it's going to church for the right reasons. That's really what we want. You know, we, we want them in the church for the right reasons. And, and the right reason is a love of Jesus Christ, uh, a desire to encounter God more deeply in their life and in, in, in their hearts. And so I would, I, wouldn't, I would put going to church more as an end goal than the immediate goal. Now, I guess it depends on where they are in their faith and where they're walking in their faith. Um, you know, for some of them, it might be they need to go to reconciliation. For some of them, it might just be they need to read a gospel <laughs> or they need to get to know Jesus or uh, you know, I think that's another difficulty that I would say. And I think it's one of the great things about your, your community there. You know, you have programs like Alpha or other things. You know, the, the, the Catholic liturgy is really not, it's the, it's the source and summit of our faith, right? That's, but the summit means it's at the top of a mountain, and it means that there's a path to get there. And I, I think many reason, another reason why we don't evangelize very well as Catholics is because we don't have any, we don't have any kind of on ramp. Like we need to have things that we can bring people to, slow and in stages. That's another common thing the church talks about with evangelization. It just takes time, slow and in stages. I would rather invite them to uh, an event, a talk a time of fellowship, maybe even a time of worship, then I would say, come to mass. Because you can't have somebody at the source and summit if they're not even at the base of, of the mountain. It just feels a little bit foreign. And then they're there and it just doesn't, uh, you know, and they're, and they're just not really going to engage as, as well as they could. So um, I think it begins more with conversations. I think there's a world of cool videos you can link things to. I mean, we have a lot of resources you know, we're resource rich, but we're often people poor when it comes to the ministry of evangelization. So uh, I would say that it sounds like there's a lot of great things going on in your parish community uh, that might be really wonderful opportunities to invite them. Uh, maybe, mass isn't the, maybe mass isn't the thing. Um, you know, we want them to do more than just go to church out of obligation. We want them to go to church for celebration uh, because they want Jesus and they want to draw closer. Um, and that actually might be a better way to think of it. Okay, so we're going to conclude there. Thank you very much, Bob. It's amazing, amazing. Thanks. <laughs> At least call those warm fuzzies. You've got a bunch of warm fuzzies, I think. Nice. So I hope that Jenny's feeling better and Bobby's feeling better and no one else gets it. But yeah. <laughs> so we have food. We have dinner for all of you. It is ready for us over in Murphy Hall. We're going to, I know, sorry, sorry. <laughs> We're going to unpack. Oh, <laughs>
<laughs> we'll unpack the talk a little bit more and um, yeah, be ready to evangelize. So thanks again, Bob. You're awesome. Thanks. <laughs> God bless you guys.